Hello everyone. My name is Tibor Gruhl. I'm a professor of ancient history at the University of Pécs, Hungary. In the next presentation, I'm going to show you how to read an ancient Christian inscription written in Latin. You don't have to worry about the vocabulary and grammar because I prepared a detailed word list to this very simple text. Let's get started. As you see, I choose a short and very simple tomb inscription, a so-called epitaph, which was made in the late 4th or early 5th century of the Common Era. The text can be found today in the Baths of Diocletian, which is the richest and most amazing museum of ancient Roman epigraphy in Rome. If we want to deal with a published inscription, which is kept in a museum, the best thing to do first is to check it in the internet databases. Now I was lucky because I found this piece in the epigraphic database Bari, which is the best collection of Christian inscriptions from ancient Rome. Here I found references to two text editions, the ICVR and the ILCV. Here we can find the exact transcription of our Latin text. But now I would like to show you how we can work on an inscription, how to read, understand, and translate it. What is the most conspicuous on this marble plaque? I'm sure you give the same answer, the pictures. So let's take these first. On the upper right hand, upper right corner, we find a very popular sign in the early Christian age, the so-called Christogram or key row symbol which is an abbreviation of the name Christos in Greek. In the epigraphy, we usually use Latin in description of the text, thus the pictures on inscriptions are referred to in double round brackets here as monogramma Christi. The Christogram is really a popular sign. Sometimes it is written in a circle, sometimes Two Greek letters, the Alpha and Omega, are added, which refer to Jesus' speech in the Revelations, chapter 1, verse 8. I am Alpha and the Omega. The Christogram became famous through the repentance story of Constantine the Great. And, indeed, we find it on the helmet of Constantine, as well as on the military standards of the Roman legions, at least from the time of Constantius II onwards. The bird with a branch is also a common motif on Christian epitaphs. Its transcription in double round brackets is avis cum ramu. But what kind of bird is that? If we carefully look at these pictures, we can see that the bird sometimes keeps the branch in its beak and sometimes it stands on a branch. The branch is most probably an olive bow, consequently the bird cannot be other than a dove or a pigeon. The next question is, what is the message of the dove and the olive branch? Naturally, it refers to the Holy Scriptures, which mention at two crucial points of its narrative the dove and the olive bow. The first is the story of Noah, when the last bird, a dove, returns to the ark, we find in Genesis chapter 8, when the dove returned to him, it means Noah, of course, in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So the meaning of the symbol is peace or God's grace. And the second is when Jesus is baptized by John in the river Jordan. We find in John chapter 1, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and resting on him. So it is the symbol of salvation or anointing. The most conspicuous picture on the epitaph is a standing man in the middle. He is wearing a typical late antique tunic and his hands are in the so-called Oran's gesture. The Orans prayer gesture is very typical in this age, and not only in Christianity, 
as we can read it in Robin Margaret Jensen's excellent book on early Christian art. By the way, the person on the right-hand side is Noah, who is praying in his ark in the middle of the flood. Next to this praying man, we see the face of a bearded man, who could be this person, the deceased called Priscus, or his brother who set up this inscription, or a saint. These are thought-provoking questions which I cannot answer at the moment. Now I am going to show you how to transcribe this simple Latin text. First, we have to make a diplomatic transcription, which means that we record only the characters as they appear on the inscription with minimal or no editorial intervention or interpretation. Since the letters can be clearly seen, it is an easy task. Let's do it. In the first line we find P-R-I-S-C-V-S. In the second, Q-V-I-V-I-X-I-T. And in the third, A-N-N-I-S-X-X-X, which means a number, of course. V-I, also numbers. In the line four, F-V-N-C-T-V-S-V-K-A-L. Fifth line, I-V-N-I-A-S-F-R-A-T-E-R. And in the last one, F-E-C-I-T-I-N-P-A-C-E. -E. So this is the so-called diplomatic transcription. And now we have to make the editorial transcript of our text which means that we try to understand the whole text, taking into account the diplomatic transcription. The most important and probably the most difficult task of this process is to resolve the abbreviations or complete the missing parts, the so-called lacunae of the text. Fortunately, our inscription is not only complete, but it contains only one abbreviation, which is the well-known calendai, namely the first day of the month. Let's see our text now. In the first line we find Priscus. In the second line, Qui Vixit. In the third line, Anis and the number, which is 36. Functus. In the fourth line, V, that is 5, Calendas. Unias, Frater, in the fifth line, and in the last line, fake it in pake. Now let's see the first line, which contains the name of the deceased, which is Priscus. This is a name which means ancient, former, old, or also means venerable. In the 4th, 5th century, Christian society, in the Christian society, it is very common that people had only one name, so it doesn't mean that he was a slave. In the second and third line, in the next part of the text, indicates the age of the deceased. Demographic researches of ancient Rome proved that 36 years can be considered as normal lifespan for a man around this time. Qui is a relative pronoun. Vixit comes from the vivo vivere, to live, in presence perfectum, which is the most popular or most common past tense in the Latin, and annis, which comes from annus, year. It's a second declension known, so it's in the ablative form. Interestingly, neither the exact date nor the cause of death was given in the inscription. However, we are informed about a day and month when Priscus departed from life. This is a very common feature in Christian inscriptions. The day and month are given according to the ancient Roman calendrical system, five days before Calendas Unias, which means 28th of May. The functus comes from fungor fungi, which is a deponent verb, also in presence perfectum, 
to it means to finish complete or to die and you can see here how can we count the the month and day the customer or as the romans said the ordinator of the epitaph may have been a very humble person he named himself only as frater which can equally mean spiritual brother fellow believer or blood brother both options are possible the text is closing with a benediction or more simply a farewell in pake can refer either to the deceased brethren or the reader of the epitaph and now let's try to come up with a proper translation priscus who lived 36 years and died 5 days before the calends of june namely 28th of may his brother made this in peace Finally, I would like to ask you some thought-provoking questions, which will help you to check what you learned and understood through this short presentation, and, perhaps, they inspire you to deepen your knowledge in the field of Christian epigraphy. My first question is, who may the man in Oran's posture be, judging particularly from his clothing? The second one? What may the connection be between the representations of the two men, the one in Oran's posture and the bearded one, and Priscus? What does the bird with the branch represent? Who may the frater of the deceased be? What does the phrase in pake refer to? Thank you very much for your attention.